video here if we get over to the computer. There we go. Feels better when there's a lot of losers around. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember a time when I wasn't surfing. My mom put me right on there. I think she pooped me out, just put me right on there. Well, what is it about surfing that you love? I love being the center of attention because it's really where I should be. And uh, I love the looks my ladies give me, you know, a little glint. I love that. I love holding the ladies. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I think so. Sort of. Come on, come with me. These are my ladies. This is Jill. This is my lady Amy. Little Susie. Brianna. You know why we call her Brianna, right? No. Yeah, it's a long story. Shaniqua. Helga. Miss Kitty. Jeannie. I dream of, uh, Teresa. This is Teresa right here. Now is Teresa, is that your... Dirty girl. This spot. This spot is for my, for my special lady, Leah. I'm gonna say that one more time. Leah. Oh, yeah. That's a sweet, sweet lady. Thank you for polishing your trophies again! I, I, Mom, I, I wasn't polishing. I was talking to my friends. I'm gonna be polishing later. Hey, hey, quick, Mr. Topanga, Mr. Topanga, could you tell us why you're not dead? No! There you go. Okay, if you weren't in church, you'd all be laughing at that video. Um, but yeah, it's a little strange for church, but it makes a really great point. Tank there has a real ego issue, doesn't he? he he's, he's all about himself and what he's accomplished in his surfing career. And, and it's kind of funny, and it's just but when we really look at it and you're sitting in church, you go, that's just so wrong, right? That's just so, so wrong, and I, that's not like us at all. <laughs> Pastor shouldn't have even showed that video in church, right? But this is, this is the reality that we actually really wrestle with. We, we, we want to say, oh, that's terrible. We, we don't, you know, this is not what, how I live. You know, there's, certainly there's people out there like that with that kind of ego and um, pride and, and, and desire for fame and all of that kind of stuff, but not us, right? But as I pondered it, um, you know, we do. We long for the same things. I'm not sure. There we go. So the, the little trophy down there in the corner, that's, that's my fame. Uh, some, some of you maybe got one of these. This is the John Philip Sousa Band Award. Woo, right? So as a senior, somebody in band gets the John Philip Sousa Award because you're like the best person in the band. It's pretty significant. I still have it somewhere in the house, but it was a lot easier to go onto Google and to just download a picture of it than actually find it and bring it right? You, you get these kinds of awards, and you know, in high school, I did the, the Perry Band Olympics. I mean, you've heard about that, right? This is, this is a big deal in Iowa, and I'm sure worldwide, everybody's heard about the Perry Band Olympics, because it's not just like the state solo contest stuff, where you go and you get a rating, and they say you get a one or a two, a three if you really kind of, eh, a little questionable, and, and four if you like totally tanked and fell apart. Um, you know, this Perry Band Olympics is they actually rank you. So they give you a, you're the best trumpet player, you're the best, uh, the second best and the third best. They actually do that kind of thing for it, you know. So I think it was on, I actually was playing baritone that year. I think I placed first on the baritone, the best at the Perry Band Olympics. <gasps> right? It's what fame and what achievement, Right? Zachary's got, there he's just showing one of his medals. I, I did a quick search this morning, and apparently he won state in rings, or rings, or was it bar, high bar, rings? Um, um, when he, that was a few years back in gymnastics. Pretty cool. Now he's got like all of these hanging in his bedroom, tro these little these medallion thingies hanging around the thing. He's got tons of them. It's hilarious, and now we're not even doing it, right? Oh, well. Uh, baseball, you got Laconia going to state, you've got uh, all, all kinds of sports uh, stuff going on, and we get all wrapped up in these things, don't we? Maybe, maybe it's not this stuff for you, maybe it's something different, 
Some of you like to show cows out here at the fair, right? To get first place in your, with your cow or your sheep or whatever, right? And, and uh, you know, or with our work, right? Um, to get a promotion, to be the best salesman, to make the most money. We, we actually kind of fall into this a lot more like Tank than we tend to realize. That, that we really do want that fame deep down. We want to be noticed, appreciated, seen, valued, right? Maybe it's dance, whatever it might be. We want people to notice our value and what we bring to the world. And the more people who notice that, the better. Wouldn't it be great to be famous? You know, as I was looking this stuff, I, I, I just had to do a little research that, you know, okay, I've moved past the band thing, so what is it to achieve something as a pastor? So I did a little research on that, and I found out that there's some lists I could make. Um, I, with doing this, I found out there's, there's lists for, for baseball. So Drew's been getting up there in the state listing kind of stuff of the best ball players in the state, right? That's pretty cool. Um, I'm looking at, uh, I didn't quite make these lists, but the one was the top 100 Christian leaders in America. I didn't make it, but someday maybe, right? Um, the next one I thought might be good would be the, the 25 most influential pastors of the past 25 years. I, I, I didn't even check that list. I'm pretty sure I'm not on it. The next one I thought this could be cool. This the top 50 ludicrously wealthy pastors. I'm not on that one either. No, no. But it'd be great, wouldn't it? No. We get all wrapped up in, in trying to achieve these kinds of things, and that is not what this is about. That is not what God desires for us. So we're going to look at a passage in Mark chapter 10. We've been in chapter 10 a little bit of just a couple of weeks ago. It's on page 1571. And I want us to dig into this passage um, because it, it deals directly with this. Chapter 10, um, page 1571, I think, is what I've got. Um, and we'll read there so that we can dig into this. I am trying to take control back to control the slides, but it's not working at the moment. So take control. We are in um, chapter 10. In this situation, again, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's been with the disciples three years, walking with them, teaching them. They've seen him do incredible things. He's told them, though, that he's going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be beaten up and flogged and tortured and killed. So he's, he's put that all out on the, the table for them, and, and they know that. That's where they're headed, and they're amazed, if you remember that from a couple weeks ago, um, astonished at, at, his, at how he's just moving forward. He's determined uh, to go to Jerusalem, and they're, they're, just, they're in awe of, of where he's at with this. And trying to understand that. So as they're on this journey, that's where our story takes place. Verse 35 is where I'm at. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. They pulled him aside. Hey, Jesus, we want to talk to you. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Then the ten heard about this. 
They became indignant with James and John. Jesus called, to them, to, called them together and said, You know that those who are, regard, are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Lord, we thank you for this story and the challenge that is in there. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to understand it as there's so much in there. Give us your wisdom to understand this passage, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You've got two perspectives coming out in this passage. You have the perspectives of the disciples and the perspective of Jesus is the bottom line. And the first one that we're going to look at here is this perspective of the disciples. It is about them. They are concerned about their place in the future, um, their fame, their glory, uh, what is their position of authority. And so they ask Jesus, would you do whatever we ask of you? What a, what a crazy question to start with, isn't it? What would you do if your child came to you and said, will you do whatever I want? Well, isn't your answer always no? Right? Of course not, because when you start with that kind of question, you just know it's not going to be good. You just know that they're not going to be asking for something that's going to make sense. And so Jesus actually plays with them a little bit. Here's the question out, well, what do you want? And they ask, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. So when I think of this passage, I think of in his glory, well, that's probably meaning, you know, up in heaven um, and, and to sit at God's right hand up in heaven. Um, but I think it, it's probably not even to that extent. You see, the disciples are still rather clueless about what's going to happen and still really hoping that Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem, conquer the Romans, and reestablish the Jewish kingdom and establish the Israelites as the people of God again. And so Jesus would be on the throne and would be the king. It would be his glory as the king over Israel and to take over the Roman world, basically. And they want to come, and we want to sit at your right and left hand, man. We want to be next in charge. Forget the other ten guys that you've been walking with. We want to be the top two, right? And Jesus, Jesus goes, you know, what are you thinking? I mean, it's much like Tank, right? This crazy penguin that thinks it's all about him. And he looks to them and, and goes, you don't understand. Can, can you drink this cup? Can, can, can you be baptized with the baptism I've been baptized with? So he talks about uh, two metaphors and then um, an example. So he first says, can, can you Drink the cup that I'm going to drink. What an incredible illustration for us that he uses the cup and baptism to help them understand this. Can you really drink the cup I have to drink? Because we all look at this and we go, the cup, his blood being poured out. And we can look into that much deeper meaning. And What did they think when he's talking about a cup? Can, they, can we drink the cup? Well, sure, we can do whatever you've got. We can handle whatever you're going to face. But we, we're able to look back on this story and to go, that cup was his blood. It was to be tortured. It was to be a sacrifice, to give up his life, to be baptized, would to be, to be submerged in the water, to go down, to die to sin and to be, to be dead, only to be raised to life, yes, but to be plunged under the water and to drown. Can, can you handle those things, disciples? And of course, they think they can. They think they can handle drinking that cup, and we'll be just fine. And then Jesus comes with even a more interesting response. He goes, 
you, and, you will, and you will, you will drink this cup, and you will be baptized with the suffering that I've experienced or will experience. You will have those things come your way. You will suffer. You, you will begin to understand this. Oh, what a downer. But I don't think they, they even get it yet at this point. That's still just going over their heads. That this, this idea of, of what does it really mean to be great. And so he uses an example and he talks about the Greeks, the Gentiles, in verse 42. He says to them, Jesus called to them together and he said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. There is, there's a power play. There, there's the folks that have power and those who don't. And the ones in power punish the ones below and force them to do things. It's, that's how the society works. Those in power get to make the decisions and everybody below has to do all the work. And Jesus goes, that's not how it's supposed to work but that's what you're wanting that's what those disciples wanted they wanted to be on the throne with jesus being the ones in authority to be able to say you do this you do that you go bring me something to eat and you get me something to drink um, and you go clean my house right that's what they really want and and we can fall into this same trap so easily of thinking well, what is it that I want? What is it I want to achieve? What do I need? And Jesus sets a whole different standard. He says that it's about serving. He says, the Son of Man himself did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus came into this world not to be the boss, not, not to be harsh or cruel, to run the church like it's, a, uh, like it's the Gentile culture, like it's the Roman situation. You have the, the governors and then you have centurions and you have different people in authority and everybody has to have this hierarchy. It's not how it works, he says. I came to serve. I came to bless you. I came to love you. And he gives specifics then about what does that look like. He says, I came to give, to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life as a ransom. So not, not just to serve, like to bring you some food, to, to bring you a drink, to give you something nice, to help clean your house. He says it's to be a ransom. What's a ransom? When we look at that word, it's, it's not, this particular word isn't used a lot, but variations of it are, are used periodically in the New Testament. It means it's a payment to free someone, essentially. So when you had a slave, um, you, you could, they could be paid for to free them from the slave owner. You could do that. That's what this is getting at. You'd be freed, but it would require something. So we look at this and go, well, um, what, what's the debt? Who, who is it that actually owes a debt? And in Romans, uh, 5, 12, or 5, Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin are death. I'm sure you've heard that passage, right? The wages of sin are death. Yep, yep, yep. We all know about that passage. What does that mean? The wages of sin are death. Um, the, well, we were talking about a payment for ransom, and now we're talking about wages. Um, it's confusing to me, so I do like I like to do sometimes. I go to the easy-to-read version of the, the Bible, if any of you have it on your computers or anything. It can be kind of handy. The easy-to-read version translates the passage this way. When people sin, they earn what sin pays, death. When people sin, you earn the reward, the result of that is death. And that's just, that's just the reality. God has set it up that that's 
what is right. That when we sin and we fall from him, there is death. And so we ask the third question there, who, who is it that really needs to be paid? And there's been some suggestion and, and within society that it's Satan that needed to be paid. If we're slaves, um, then we, we need to pay Satan, or God had to pay Satan in order to free us from Satan. But again, it's, it's sin that is the debt, and it's really the Father whom we have to restore the relationship with. And so that takes death. And so Jesus here is talking about his death, dying on a cross, so that we're forgiven and we don't have to pay the debt or the punishment for our sin. Jesus' death was the payment to free us from the punishment and the control of sin. It doesn't mean that sin is gone from our lives. It doesn't mean that you are free from temptation and you will not have any other problems. But you are free in Christ from the punishment of that sin. And you're also free from the control of sin. And that's part of the, the challenge in our life, right? Because we, we can still feel like we're controlled by certain sins in our life. And we can't escape it. Because we get sucked in so much and Satan's working so hard to surround us with temptation and to lead us down the road of sin. But in Christ... You're freed from the control of your sinful nature. The Spirit of God is at work in you and giving you a way out of your sin. That's the good news of the gospel. You are not controlled by your sinful nature. It's still at work. It's still trying to lead you away. But you also have the Spirit of God in you to try and lead you into a better direction, away from sin. We've been talking about how God has blessed you, and that's what Jesus has just done. He is explaining to us how he has blessed us. We've talked about the first three. God's spirit lives in me. God listens to me. God invites me to his table. There's tremendous ways that God has blessed us. And today we look at God paid my debt. I, I, as a sinful person, I owe a debt I cannot pay, and Jesus comes into the picture and he pays that debt for me. And so I am free from the punishment and the control of sin. That is the good news, folks. And that is what we come and we share and we rejoice in. Now, the application of this is where it gets a little more interesting yet. The application, Jesus says, you're not to live like the Gentiles. This lording it over people and having authority and telling people how it's supposed to be. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be a slave. He goes, just like that, that's what I did. I came to you as a servant that is what you are to do. This is the way you are to live and to function, to give your very life for, for my cause, to love others. Now, I would love to stand here and tell you, you should get involved in the church and serve in all kinds of ways so that um, you, you experience the joy of serving. We hear it more and more, right? That, that it's, it feels good to serve. And that's the motivation. You should come do this or that and get involved in blessing others because you'll feel good. And there's, there's some truth to that. It's a blessing to bless others. But Jesus is not talking about that approach to serving at all. Jesus comes to us and says, you should serve because that's what I did. And it's, it's not necessarily going to feel good. It's going to hurt. It, it, it's sacrificial serving. It's suffering. Oh, Does anybody want to go suffer in the nursery next week? Right? Well, that, that doesn't sound like... Some of you are like, I love to be with the children and to be with the babies, right? It's, it's not suffering at all. That's okay. 
We still, we're glad that you're back there doing it. For some of us, it would be suffering, right? Because they'd all cry and scream, and then we'd have to change a diaper. That's true suffering, right? What, what does this really look like for us? When we talk about serving as Christ served, we, we tend to think, oh, I served in the nursery. I'm a greeter at church. Um, we, we can come up with all kinds of things that, that we do. And this church is involved in doing lots of things. But when we look at this passage and really try to understand what Jesus is talking about, he's saying he came to serve lost people, people outside these doors, and to do it in such an incredibly sacrificial manner that it would hurt, it would take all that he's got, including his very life, to show love to the lost. And we go, can we have a little bit of time from you, right? And it would be such a blessing if you serve in the nursery or, or help out with VBS or whatever. Um, because you'll feel so good after you've done that. So you should rejoice in doing that. Um, and Jesus kind of comes to us and goes, this is going to hurt. I want you to serve to a point that you're exhausted, you're weary, and, and you have given your absolute best and all you've got to bless our community. Not just to serve within the church and to meet the needs of whatever functions within the church, but to bless our community. Oh. So, begin with prayer is where we started. That we can do, right? We can pray for our neighbors. That's, that's, that's attainable. Listening to our neighbors, it got a little more difficult to sit and actually have some conversation with them, to talk over the fence maybe to invite them over and eat with them. It gets even a little more difficult. I thought, oh, service. Everybody likes to serve, and, and this church is doing great at it. And the more I read this passage, the more I went. But we have the wrong impression of what service really is. It's, it's giving a little bit of my time. You know, I, I, should, I should help out with something. You know, kind of just quench my guilt a little bit. And Jesus comes to us and says, no. I want you to give your very life to serve others. And, and that's the challenge we face. Um, I'm thrilled with the elders and uh, what we just decided on Tuesday night. Um, Ron, Van, or Ron Daney came to us um, and is doing breakfast on the farm. So he's hosting this thing for Fond du Lac. And so three to 4,000 people apparently come out to his farm on the 25th and get breakfast. So how many of you done, have gone to a breakfast on the farm? A bunch of you, but some of you have not, and that's what I've heard is, some of you like, no, oh yeah, we do, do this all the time, uh, and, and some of you, I've never done, I have no idea what you're talking about. So, breakfast on the farm, eggs and whatever else, and so then that's what they do. It's Sunday mornings, and uh, eight to noon is what that event actually is. Ron came and said that he'd, only ho that he'd only host it if they did a worship service out there. And so then he asked us to do or help with that worship service. And our elders went, what a great way to serve our community and to bless our community. Let's do it. So they've jumped forward with this after Tuesday and are renting a tent to set up out there and uh, figuring out seating, figuring out sound system stuff, figuring out worship and what we'll do out there for a service. What an exciting thing. We also said we need a lot of extra greeters. We want some people, extra people helping with parking for any of the older folks walking on the grass and so forth. We want to have plenty of people available to help walk you into the area and, and get you seated um, and, and not make that more difficult than it needs to be. Um, and so we've got sign-up sheets out there uh, right in the middle of the lobby for you to sign up for that. It's a great opportunity. We're talking about lots and lots of people who will at least have to walk directly past the tent where we'll be worshiping and have the opportunity to hear God's word. Who knows how many people might want to actually venture into the service. 
but we have a great opportunity. And so I want to ask that you would consider sacrificing, you know, as you come to church to come a little early, be one of the greeters, to welcome others. Um, and, and as our congregation, I want to mention this too. You're the last ones that get to sit. If it's full, you have to get up and, and, and give up your seat, stand somewhere else. Now, if you're elderly, okay, uh, don't, you can stay seated. Don't, don't take that too literally, okay? But for most of us, if it's really that full, I don't have any idea what to expect. But I want us to be servants in that spot, okay? And so sign up as a greeter or an usher or parking um, or whatever else we might need. Uh, if you've got the card in your pew, fill that thing out. You can tell us on there what you can do. Not only do we have that going on, but we have uh, in the park that same afternoon, our outreach committee had already planned to do the um, kickball and, and some other activities, uh, some sporting things uh, that we should be a lot of fun out there. And we've promoted that within the community already as well. Um, and so that is happening. And so if you're able to help serve with that, uh, that would be great. They're working on food uh, for that event. And then as well, um, a, a little bit of fun competition uh, for kids with hitting, batting, and running. So if you want to help with that, there's also a sign up out there on the table for that. They need bars for that. Um, like I said, we have all kinds of opportunities for you to do some things. VBS is coming up and there's some sign ups for that. Uh, to get involved with, and then even serving at the community table on June 30th. Folks, there are needs in our community, and we have some awesome opportunities this summer to bless others, to pray for them, to listen to them, to eat with them with, with these different events, and ultimately to serve them, and all of that so that we can get to number five and be able to share with them. So next week, we'll talk about what do I actually say? What does that look like? Um, for now, I want to urge you to go, can you help on the 25th? Um, with the morning, the evening, uh, we just need to know names and, and what we've really got so that we can coordinate um, and make it the greatest event we've had um, in a long time. May we serve like Jesus served. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to be on the farm, for the opportunity to be in the park, to do VBS right here, and to serve at the community table. For Relay for Life is another one that's out on the table there to help with. Lord, we help, pray that you'd help us to have a servant's heart, that we wouldn't simply respond with, I'm too busy, I'm weary, I can't do it. But Lord, help us to make serving a priority and not just a minimal sacrifice, but that we're, we're thrilled to get up and, and help set up with this event, that we would rejoice in coming in early or working the Saturday to help us set up Lord, give us joy in those things, but um, help us to know that even when it all falls apart and we're exhausted and we're weary of serving you, you give us hope and joy and peace. Would you use this congregation, Lord? Would you help us to bless this community, that people come to know you, to love you, and that we would help them to grow to be more and more like you? We pray that people would see this congregation and know that we're doers of the word. We don't just talk, but we live it and we do it. Would you bless this time, Lord? Bless the offerings that we now give. Lord, we, we just spent some money on a tent. Um, we need to spend some more money on some sound system things. Would you provide for these kind of events? Thank you for the support of elders and deacons who just kind of go, we need to do it. And we pray that you would provide for every need this congregation has and well beyond it. 
that we can have a tremendous impact on this community, Lord. Bless these gifts as we give in Jesus' name. Amen. If the deacons would come forward.